Um, and today, we're really, really excited because we actually get to reimagine the future. We get to think about what the world could and maybe should be like um, if we were to rethink and repurpose how we think about the world today. And we get to do that with Poe Bronson. So I want to welcome Poe to the stage. And technology is just going to work seamlessly. Maybe. Yay! The first thing I think we need to do, though, before we get into rethinking the world, we need to kind of unpack what we mean by biotech. I know we've got people joining us today that will know that, and you can, you, know, you can close your ears for a moment, but there's lots of people in the room and there's lots of people on the line that'll be like, well, what is biotech really? It's something science-y, I don't really understand it. My parents owned a fruit and veggie shop. They have no idea what I do. They haven't understood my career for the last 20 years of my life. So we have a thing in Australia that I like to do to frame these conversations, Poe. It's called the barbecue test. How do we explain what um, biotech is and why it matters in, in just simple language at the barbecue on Saturday that we're all going to go to or on Sunday afternoon? So every year, 145 million people join the world to grow crops. In 10 years, that's nearly 1.5 billion people. When you're middle class, you use a lot more of the world. Right now, we have about a million people working on the crops. We're going to double it in just 10 years. We have to find a way for the, that's five Earths worth of materials we need to extract and mine out of our known world, just to pump into our economy for houses, food, cars, shoes, clothes, everything. So we have an insanely large sustainability challenge. It's not just how we've done it in the past, it's how to meet this incredible demand for the future. And believe it or not, but biology as a technology is a way to do this at extremely low power. Following the second law of thermodynamics, it can get us to build so much of the new world, as not as a new world thing, but as actually replacing the way we've done all of this extraction and exporting over the last 200 years. Awesome. All right. So we are struggling. I um, think I failed the test. I think I failed the barbecue test. Like, <laughs> it wasn't fun enough. Let me try again. OK. OK, okay let's try again. Let's try again. OK. Uh, okay. I loved the um, explanation. My parents would sit there and go, I'm not sure how to digest that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Um, we use cells and we program them to make all manner of things from sneakers to oils to food to wood and we use all of living biology cell types as programmable factories love it no i'm, that... going, I'm failing again okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard okay <laughs> Let's move on. All right, don't invite me to a barbecue. That's OK. <laughs> um, no, I love it. And actually, it's a really good illustration of why this is so hard to bring people on this journey, because the science is actually quite complex and complicated. However, the outcomes of, of what the, the impact of it is, if we get it right, is huge. Um, and I think, I think the conversation we're about to go on is going to help us. So we might have to come back to the barbecue test at the end of the conversation and see if we've both got there and got an answer, because I don't have one either. So, um, so let's, let's start rebuilding the world. So we were talking about this the other day, and it really spurred my mind. You know, in 1943, Maslow published his Hierarchy of Needs. And he was making the case that we have to have our basic physio physiological needs met, food, water, shelter, warmth, security, all of that sort of stuff, before we can achieve our creative capacity. Right? And there's a, there's a lot of thought in the world that now we can live with purpose and follow our dreams and, you know, really um, fulfill all of the things that we are created to do because we've solved our basic hierarchy of needs. And yet when I looked, we were talking earlier, when I look to young people today and look at what's going on in the world, their entire psychological purpose is to actually deal with the fact that our, our hierarchy of needs are being made from flawed products and concepts and they're leading to global warming and to climate change and we've got 
people fearful about food security, we've got people fearful about health and pandemics, and so it seems like we've come full circle and we're back at going, oh my goodness, our basic hierarchy of needs are maybe not serving us and we have to serve them a little bit. So, you talked about in this great, um, this great piece of work that you did about the $100 trillion opportunity, um, we have a choice of either being ruinous, um, of ruinous consumption or reinventing production. And so I think that's where I want to start, is exploring this idea about rethinking our basic needs and maybe starting with food. Because we know food is one of, you know, and, and sustainability of food is one of the UN SDGs. It's something that the world is thinking about. It's something that we're challenged with. But if we were to do that, rethink food and food production and just food in every broad sense of it through the lens of bio, biotechnology, what would we do? How would it be different and better? So at IndieBio, we were the world's first venture investor into the lab-grown meat sector with Memphis Meats, now Upside Foods, six years ago. Um, and we've continued to do food redesign over this period of time. We now have four to 45 companies in the space and, and tons and tons of people have joined us. And we're still sort of following in line of like the Beyond Meats and the V2 Foods and the others who are kind of doing with plant-based. But that's beginning to show the possibility of doing this in a very, very different way. Literally eliminating the slaughter of animals um, as almost just an inspiration for all the things that can be done. So with the food system, it actually starts with the crops. It starts with the soil and the crops, actually, where only 2% of the world's land, agricultural land right now, is organic, and 98% is heavily fertilized, and that's running into our waterways. That has to stop. We have to do a better job of making high-performance, organic approaches to crop growth. But more than that, in, taking examples like rust, the disease that's hitting wheat all over the world. In Australia, in the US, our wheat can handle cold. In Australia, your wheat can't handle cold. The genes of that, despite all the genetic work that's been done in the world, you'd think we know the genes of it. We don't. You know, you don't, we don't actually know it. It'd be really handy, half the world eats rice. It would sure be handy to plant rice early in the season when it's cold, because then it can outcompete weeds and it's a way more fruitful crop. But we don't know the genes for cold tolerance. Well, we kind of do. The entire world's effort on this had discovered three genes as until March. Then we had a company with a new algorithm turned it on and it's discovered 32. Wow. So we can actually re-engine, and I don't mean GMO the crops. I'm talking about there's natural variety in the crops that we can use. There are wheats that are resistant to rust. There are citrus that are resistant to greening. There are legumes that can be used for plant-based meats that are low in terpenes and don't have the bitterness. There are all manner of nutritional value in all of the crops we grow. Just discovering those genes, and I'm not talking about GMOing it, is critical to the world's food supply. And then in the processing of, of food, we've heard so often that half of food is wasted. And we often think like that's fundamentally bad. One of the things I want to constantly remind people, it's like, it's like plastics aren't bad. It's the fact that we haven't figured out a business model to make it worth people's time to capture them rather than throw them in a river. So it's this is a like if we can make food waste valuable people will turn it around and turn it into a circular economy so we have a company that turns food waste into hydrogen we have another company that turns food waste back into nut butters and coffee and chocolates by upcycling this you can grow microbes on food waste and then that becomes a new plant-based product so it's more about making things circular than not doing it think of water like there's a sort of shortage of water. Well, the water isn't, sh we're not short of the water. Like it goes in the ground and then it comes back out again. It's, it's clean circular water that we have a shortage of, not water itself. And the more we can make things circular with biology or biochemistry, 
the more we can enable all of these markets. So at the front end, we have cell-based meats and we have plant-based meats and we can do those kinds of things. I would say that, wait, why is it always about the proteins? It should be about the oils, the fats, the sh we can redesign the sugars, the fibers. We're, the world is missing so much fiber in our diet. We're all of us are like walking around 95% deficient of fiber. We can solve our health problems, solve our, our sort of demographic health problems that it's hurting our economies and, and just by sort of adding more fiber to our diet. So it's, it's a world of solutions, all seen sort of through the realm of food. The interesting question might be why is biotech attacked food so hard over other markets? And it's a really simple answer. It's because we eat three times a day. And so we make choices a lot and can intersect those choices. And in addition, it's one space where people can vote with their dollars, mm -hmm. where consumers and eaters actually can do something about the environment and sustainability. Because many of the other things they want to do something about, but they can, it's, the decisions are being made on such a macro level that all they can do is protest about that. I think it's um, super interesting to hear you talk about it in such a, a, a broad way, that it isn't just about, and it's great to hear that it's not just about cell-based meats, um, that's great, but I think the whole, whole system of food and production and the cycle of waste is really interesting. We see a little bit of that here. Um, I actually, I think I saw the, yeah, I did see our resident sustenant in the, in the room today, and they actually deal with the on-farm waste and actually taking that and, and turning that to enriched products around fodder for the supply chain and looking at what else can they do with that. Um, how far away are we from really seeing a significant dent, um, I guess, in, in, in economic terms of, of, of uptake or adoption of, of things in, these, in, this, in this space, do you think? And that's probably both in the production of food, um, on farm, you talked about sort of the genetic things that we need to know and, and discover, but also in cell-based meats. Do you think that's something we're going to see you know, in the next five, 10 years, or is it going to take us 25 years before everything is, is redone? Oh, it's easily going to take us 25 years. Yeah, <laughs> like we're at two and a half percent adoption right now. And, uh, and we also can, to be clear, take traditional protein or livestock and make that far more sustainable. And we invest in that too. So whether it's doing carbon neutral beef or it's doing shrimp with no antibiotics and no effluent, like there are so many ways we can take traditional foods and make them more sustainable. Um, I think we're at two and a half percent adoption because we need, you know, 97 and a half other solutions. Mm -hmm. We have a few and we need more. And I don't think it's a lack of marketing. To some extent in the food system, like all capital markets, there are players who want to recover their sunk costs before they convert to a new technology. And there's always a hedge in there, be it PE funds or venture capital that'll say, you know, we'll fund that and then we'll displace the incumbent because the incumbent's trying to be careful with their capital. By and large, I think that it's a massive, massive growing market, but it doesn't mean we're gonna have changed everything even in 25 years. And I say this with respect, you know, food is culture. Um, I, my grandfather was a rancher. My wife's grand, great grandparents were shrimpers, right? Like, and, and when we eat, we have memory, we have history, we have a connection to our ancestors, and we don't give that up easily. And we can't just go around telling the world, you know, you've got to start eating something different and give up your identity and your history. Mm. And so I think that, you know, culture can change pretty fast, but it'll still feel like a radical change. I just don't think it's going to be like overnight the world shifts over. Mm -hmm. I actually love that point that you make about culture. 
um, it is a real need to go on a journey together and actually bring people with us. And that's why this sort of notion of storytelling and talking about what the opportunity is and why it matters and how do we go there together is, is one we want to engage in early and often and take people on that journey. Um, so we're going to sort food out. It's in process. We need 97 more solutions. So those of you that are watching online and those of you that are in the audience have got a solution get cracking. We want it in market in 25 years, thank you very much. Preferably in five years uh, would be good so that we can drive adoption. So there's not too, if you've got a great idea, it's not too late is the, the takeaway from that. Um, but if we're talking about the next thing, so food is, is one of the areas that we need to solve for, for basic production. The built environment and the materials we use, you touched on it with plastic. Um, you did talk about cities and, and you know people rising out of, um, you know, out of poverty and, and out of places into to bigger homes and things, we really need to think about shifting away from chemical-based processes to sustainable biological processes. If we were to fast forward 25 years, and, 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 and I know you're seeing some of this right now, into a perfectly rebuilt world, um, and you can include cities, homes, the products, the things we use. I'm giving you, I'm giving you a large space to play with your thinking here. Um, what do materials look like? What will, you know, will our shelter be different? Will our facilities, our roads, our homes, what will be they be made out of? What are, what are some of the things that you're seeing come down the line and what are some of the things that you get excited about? So uh, I will say, you know, one could have had this conversation 102 years ago and said, you know, this wrought iron and that we have that comes from France or this Victorian style architecture, surely this will be gone in 100 years, right? <laughs> but we actually love it and we kept it, right? Yeah. So I think it's more about these materials adapting to our, again, our cultural tastes. Mm. I'm very excited about green cement. I'm very excited about the capabilities of microbial communities to be the binder, to replace the cement in an aggregate stack, because the world is, as it's growing, uses insane amounts of cement, and nothing wrong with that. But what right now, to make the clinker, we use massive, G massive GHG emissions with cement. Fundamentally, what we're talking about is things being done at high temperature, now being done at low temperature. That's fundamentally what, how biology replaces chemistry. Think of it, if we do it inside of a microbe, actually want you to think of a microbe as a chemistry lab, where normally in a chemistry lab, you'd be blowing things up and things would be highly toxic and volatile, and you do like 19 experiments in a row to go from oil to say, adipic acid, which is in everything. But if you do it in a micro with an enzyme, there's 19 steps at room temperature and with no energy needed. You just need a catalyst that starts, sparks a chain reaction. And so biology is this inevitability of the second law of thermodynamics, which is that the world will always reward lower energy and greater dispersion of energy. And it's like we reward profit or the bottom line, we reward low energy uses. And so it's an inevitable shift that we make towards biological, essentially biological chemistry. Uh, so other materials that I love, we have a company, Microworks, that makes leather without the cow. They do it with mycelium. They program mycelium, not with genetic code, with nothing but light and humidity and oxygen, and they can turn it into incredible leather, leather-like replacements. I think that all of the polymers that we use and the plastics, I'm not giving up on plastics. The problem is that those carbon-carbon bonds, we need to break them. All we need is an enzyme. We need to discover those enzymes, and we have been. And they, I think that they are doable. But I think as long as we reward people to recycle them, we can use them because they're incredibly dynamic materials. Um, so I'm not like a let's never use plastic again. It's let's find ways to make them circular, assemblable, and, and then reconstructable materials. Um, and uh, elsewhere in like material spaces that I'm particularly excited about, 
I would say glues, paints, like everything that smells is pretty much like everything that's got that kind of spiky smell that sounds smells kind of toxic, like every one of those things that would do. But basic stuff like wood, you know, we have a company that does wood without the tree. Like we've got to stop cutting down hardwoods. We can't, it, there'll be a time in the future where we'll look back at today and think, we, it was really legal to cut down those old trees. Like, I can't believe that was once legal. <laughs> Just like my kids say, I've seen these movies, these things called phone booths. What were they? Why, why did you have them? What did you do in a phone booth? Like, <laughs> it, that's how weird cutting down a hardwood tree is going to be in the future. Because we don't need to do it anymore. We can literally make that wood uh, from plant fibers today. <laughs> Can, can you say a little bit more about that in this company? Tell us about how this company is actually doing that and building, basically growing or building wood without trees. I think that for most people here, has anybody heard about that? A couple of people? <laughs> okay, basically a room full of people that definitely want to hear this story. Okay, okay, okay. So the company is here south in the city and it's got, it's basically 99% cardboard. So it's got like this loose honeycomb cardboard that's wavy. And then they make their wood laminate from flax seed fiber. And they lay it on with a bioresin. It's paper thin. So you've got this like cardboard that's flexible. It's super, super thin. And you lay it on and then it dries. It looks just like wood. It's light as tissue paper. And then they hand to you and they say, try to break it. You try to snap it over. You can't, you can't even bend it. It's seven times stronger than steel wow. and lighter than carbon fiber. That's the kind of stuff biology makes. Look at our natural world around us. It's incredible what it does. If we can do what nature has done, we would have insane materials. We just, nobody ever asked nature before to make super lightweight wood that's as beautiful as hardwood, but can, have all those neat conformational shapes you need for our car interiors. But nature could have done it if we'd asked. And we're asking now. I love, um, I actually love that, that, that question, what will we ask nature to do? Like, what will we ask nature to do today? It's a really fascinating one. I want to come back to the plastics ones and the polymers and unpack that a little bit more because I think there's some really interesting threads that we need to go to. Immediately when most people think of plastics, they think of glasses, they think of forks, they think of disposable things that food is in and things like that. But it goes so much further. It goes to the elasticity in um, any of your skinny jeans, including mine, that I might be wearing today. Um, it goes to stretch fibres in your t-shirts, into your socks, into almost anything and everything, your fabric and your, your, your couches at home, into so many different areas. And, and it's, it's a really interesting one. I had a privilege of um, working with a company in the Startmate program recently called Ulu that's just starting, and they're actually producing polymers out of seaweed um, to mm -hmm. actually kind of replace this. Talk to me about the sort of things. I'd love to get some stories of the sort of companies because that wood one is a brilliant story, right? It's, it's something that's stronger than wood, lighter than wood. It, the applications for that are tremendous. Um, you know, it's not taking up natural resources. What are you seeing in what, what is nature providing for us in the plastic replacement space that you get excited about and that you're seeing emerge? Well, there's a lot of parts. When I say parts, it literally like car parts, frisbees, all, you know, all manner of things where we, we use plastic just because we can and we could use a lot of other materials, natural materials that are repurposed from say agricultural waste mm. with corn starch with a little bit of a biochemistry and we've got something really hard, firm, beautiful looking. Um, but the feet, those tend to be physically firm. Mm. The, as you mentioned, the sort of Young's modulus, the sort of elastic, but durable properties are much harder to reach. You know, a, a cheap little plastic fork to have with your lunch is, doesn't need any nylon 66 in it, right? Barely needs any nylon 6 in it. It can, be, it can be a throwaway. But to make plastics high performance, you need these essentially core things like nylon 66, which is HMD and adipic acid. What nature does in these things is it does, it creates pathways that if you discover, like we have companies that have done this, that can 
essentially make adipic acid for the first time in an emissions-free biological way with no green premium required. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of it. Like, these business models have always been about, well, you're going to have to pay more to make it sustainable. And, you know, we're going to have to cut back. And it's going to hurt the economy, but we have to do it. And I don't believe in that at all. Like, at IndieBio, we believe in this fact that the economy is going to double in size. It's a $100 trillion economy. So it's going to add $100 trillion in value in the next 23 years. We can go get it and make all sorts of opportunity out of it. It's not about cutting back. It's about reinventing mm. and finding a new way to do it. So I think in the polymer space, there's incredible innovations. If there's a challenge to it, it's that there's so many of them, the hard to determine which one's the best one to back. And there sort of isn't one company conquering it. You know, there isn't a Airbnb of biopolymers that like owns it all. And we investors know where to put our money and the bankers know what to take public and it's clear. It's just not, it's all over the place. And that makes it kind of a disorganized market. Yeah. But it's happened. And it's, it's a super interesting one for me. I, I get really excited about this one because I think we actually need more than one solution anyway. Because the, the, the challenge will be if we find one solution and it's in its source stock is seaweed or its source stock is something, we actually then fall into that danger of, well, how do we actually make sure we're doing, you know, sourcing that produce sustainably in a way that we're not actually creating harm in trying to do yeah. good as well, which is super interesting. Um, I, I love the new materials space. It gets me excited. We could stay on that conversation, but we, we do have to also sort out climate and health. So we've got, you know, we've got in, in the window of time that we have, we have, to, we have to sort out climate and health and talk about how biotech is going to change that for us and, and, and do things. And just a reminder to, to everybody that's watching online in the room, if you do want to ask a question, we're hoping to get to a couple of questions um, uh, live. So the, on Twitter, if you just use the hashtag AskPo, um, we will get to those in, in just a little bit. But let's talk about climate, because climate intersects, you know, we've, we've actually touched on climate in both of these two topics already, um, in the fact that we can do things that are, have a, a, a less of an impact or lessen the impact in production on the climate and on the environment. But what about, um, you know, looking, looking at how biotech could help us reverse carbon emissions um, or even, you know, if we're even asking the right questions, because I think we talk about a lot about, you know, how much damage that we're doing and that, you know, every year humans using fossil fuel puts 200 times more carbon into the atmosphere than volcanoes do. We're not going to get our goals. We're going to miss the mark. We're going to miss the target. I sometimes wonder if we're even having the right conversation about climate um, to make those difference. But, but what's biotech going to do to help us? What is it already doing to help us? What is it going to do over the next 25 years? And what do we need to get excited on and get a deeper understanding about? So we could all imagine a need to pull CO2 out of the sky, right? So I'm thinking, play a little game with you, Sally. I'm thinking of a compound that automatically, when it's exposed to CO2, gets rid of the, what it's bound to and grabs that CO2 and takes it away to where we can get rid of it. I'm thinking of this compound and it's not magical. It's not in Iceland or in Northern Canada where it's doing this stuff. It's in all of our bodies. It's in every one of us and we have 10 billion cells that are doing this. It's called hemoglobin. It's actually not weird and wild and strange at all to grab CO2 out of the air and to take it away. Amines like Ephedrine naturally do this. It's a natural thing. I think to the scope of this, it's important to remember that we, we're a blue planet. We were a red planet and we didn't have oxygen. And then microbes came along and it had the great oxygenation event and we filled the atmosphere with oxygen. We can do it again. It fundamentally comes down to chemistry and to microbes pulling CO2 out of the air. And all we need is to pay for it. We can do it and we can do it better. But all we need to do 
is set a price and reward people for doing it. We're not doing that right now. And there is a carbon price in most of the world's 192 countries. It's not high enough. All we got to do is raise the price and a whole bunch of technologies that have been created will go, up on, go online. They're sitting there in labs. We're waiting for society to say, please take carbon out of the atmosphere. People are like, oh yeah, we got a hundred ways to do that. It's not, can we do better ways? Sure, but like, we can start this. We can start pulling, denitrifying and deacidifying the ocean. The technologies exist. They're here now. We have several of them. It's just that the world doesn't want to pay for it enough yet. Tell, tell us so, about some of those ones that you have, because I think that'll paint a real picture of, of, of what we could see in the market for us. So one we have is a company called Carbix, and it's a green cement company. And there are other green cement companies. And I don't know if ours is better than the others or stuff, but what we focus on is speed. We figure that when people are ordering cement, they want it to come fast, they want it to be poured fast, want this stuff to happen. So not totally unlike other companies, we suck CO2 out of the air, then we actually add energy in the form of, of, of blue light, essentially, and we speed up a natural reaction that goes from CO2 to rock that normally takes 2,000 years, and with the presence of some minerals, you can bring it down to two years. With the presence of minerals and some light, some UVCC, we can bring it down to two hours. Wow. So we can suck CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it in our concrete in two hours, uh, two, two to three hours, if we want to pay for it. <laughs> you know, if you, it works, <laughs> like, <laughs> it works. Like the world just doesn't want to, isn't ready to pay for this stuff. And, that's the fundamental issue. Like these are uh, chemistry and biochemistry things and everyone wants us to find it cheaper, find it better. And it's like, uh, just start paying for it. And then once it's rewarded, the profit incentive will take us from there. People will definitely, there's so much innovation going, but once you start seeing how much money you can make, cause there's a, so much CO2 in the sky, you can just get rewarded. You can be the Google of pulling stuff out of the sky. And someone will, someone will be that company, you know? That's just one example, but there's many, many in this space, you know? I, I really love that, um, that you know, you, you, you're pretty clear on it. It's we need people to start paying for it. And that over time, and we've seen this time and time again, I think about smartphones coming to market, I think about all the consumables that we have, where people will be like, I will never pay $1,000 for a phone. Well, guess what? Yes, you will. Um, probably 20 times over, and that thing that you paid $1,000 for is $200 now, or $50 now, and the next $1,000 thing is there. Um, so we definitely have an appetite to do it. We just have to really kind of knuckle down and, um, and go in that direction. Um, I'm really keen, health is a big one, and it's a massive focus, and I think the link to biotech is, is a really obvious one. However, I do think that the health space, we, we don't necessarily, we haven't necessarily understood the opportunity and the fullness of it and what it could mean in, in, in biotech and, and reimagining health. Um, that said, I think there's never a better time, there's never been a better time to talk to the entire world about health and what science can do to improve human health and well-being. Because for, for the first time in my lifetime at least, everybody's eyes are on science for solutions around you know, the pandemic, but it's not just about that. Um, what are some of the things that you see as really big innovations or really significant step changes that biotech has unlocked, but where do you see that going? Because I know there's things that we've seen unlocked, we probably haven't necessarily seen the fullness of that yet, um, but there's, there's more to be unlocked. Yeah, so let me put it, if I can, in the context of some incredible praise for biotech and what it's done, but also what it hasn't done, right? And so I would say in, most importantly, this has happened kind of in the background, is that using bioinformatics to create drug trials for the right group of patients has quietly in the last six and a half years doubled the success rate of the pharmaceuticals industry. So the pharmaceuticals industry was six years ago, truly at a breaking point. 
only 8% of its clinical trials were successful. And that was killing the industry. And by bringing bioinformatics, you basically doubled its success rate and the industry is flourishing because of it and now has the profits and the money to pour back into R&D. So we were really at a brink six, seven years ago and it's great that this has happened. And this, this isn't like CRISPR, but this is like what's really driven the economics of the industry to allow us to be innovative in the first place. Then speaking of CRISPR, I would actually put CRISPR as just one little thing in the whole category of nucleic acid medicines. The idea that we could program a drug. Uh, we could program gene therapy. We could program a vaccine like the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, the programmable RNA vaccines. And the idea that whether it's RNAi or antisense oligosaccharides, we could use genetic code to program something to work to again, most importantly, improve the success rate and drastically reduce the risk, that changes the whole paradigm of the industry, which has always had massive amounts of risk in it. And the third thing I think that we've unlocked is, we've begun to unlock is autoimmune disease. I think that just 20 years ago, a lot of autoimmune diseases weren't recognized as such, and a lot of them were recognized as fake diseases or phantom diseases or in your head. And now we know what they are. They're a fundamental dysregulation of our body's own ability to tell friend from foe. And by being able to tune that and program it and control it, we begin to attack this space. Now notice of all those things I said, none of those are really in the public health factor, right? Meanwhile, in the US, what's happened? We have 84 million people with prediabetes. That means we're going to double our diabetes population in just the next 10 years. Mm. We have no way to pay for it and no idea what's coming. It's a time bomb that's literally down to the last few years. We are trying to do stuff about it, but we just keep getting more and more metabolic syndromes. People are getting more obese. Dysregulation is happening. All over, and it's a, not just about health. It's an economic time bomb that we don't know how to pay for. So I would say, while we're doing amazingly well on like full on therapeutics, what we're doing a terrible job is just keeping average people healthy, keeping them fit, getting them exercise, getting them to eat well. And that's a part that often is so frustrating because it feels like, well, if they could just do it themselves. I'm one of those people like, I, you know, <laughs> I, it almost feels like not a problem, you know? Again, it's like in your head is the problem and we're missing what's really going on. And so all manner of public health is in dire needs and needs a lot more intervention, it needs grand solutions for it. So speaking of those grand solutions, we've seen some real leaps and, and, and bounds in the last couple of years with people really kind of looking at both, I think, treatment and, and diagnostics. Um, can you give us some examples of what you've seen, particularly in the last couple of years at, at IndieBio? I know um, reading the book, you know, there was, it, it's a really interesting approach of how people see a crisis or a challenge and a, a, a threat to, to, to humanity globally. Um, how they're able to radically kind of respond to that in a way that maybe without, you know, um, Symbio, we couldn't have really done it previously. Can you give us some, some concrete examples of what you've kind of seen and what you're seeing? Because I think that'll really help unpack it for those of you in the room that, uh, for those in the room and watching online who, who don't get to see that exposure to some of the companies that you've, you've given birth to maybe in the last, you know, little bit as well. Sure. Well, just to set this year, you know, we did three new COVID companies, but also had alumni turn to COVID. And if everyone turns their clock back in their mind for a second, imagine, remember about a year ago, people were recognizing, wow, well, um, if we can create antibodies for this, for this disease, we can protect people. And so there was an incredible rush to design new antibodies. So we have a company, Prelis. It's been for a while printing 
had the goal of printing human organs outside the body. That they're not the only ones doing that, but we think they're the world leader in that. But in a time of COVID, they pivoted in an amazing way. They began to print human lymph nodes and they would print, you know, 96 of them. And then they would give them COVID and the human lymph nodes would design the antibodies the natural way using VDJ recombination, just like your body does. And literally in 10 days have antibodies that you could then now take into biological production. They didn't have, they weren't in mice that have to be humanized. They weren't in silico that have to be tested. They were like actual antibodies made by a human immune system outside the body. And you could screen for which one was the best. And it's now off to the races as a company as an antibody discovery platform, essentially doing things I've never done before, essentially little organoids um, by the hundreds, inventing the antibodies for you faster, way faster than a computer can do it. And it's, it's fascinating that biologically can, bi biology is faster than robots by far. You know, we, we think of things like, even there's synthetic biology companies that use robots to like, and to design every gene and try everything. And we can just use directed evolution and recombination and we can beat the robots by a thousandfold in, in a Petri dish using microfluidics. So biology is far more powerful than people will imagine. In fact, putting the robots out of work is one of my favorite theses. You know, the robots are putting the humans out of work. Let's put the robots out of work. Why not? I love it. That's the absolute tagline. Synthetic biology, putting the robots to shame and out of work, making them redundant. But I think that's a perfect example. I, I'm, I'm so glad you actually told that story. I was hoping that that would be the one that you would pick, although I would be fascinated by any of them, because I think it's a really, it's a really great insight to think about how do we actually approach scientific discovery? How do we approach solutions differently? How do we become the kind of founders and the kind of inventors and creators that look at nature, that look to solutions in biology, in chemistry, and go, let's rethink this. And that's the perfect example of a company that's pivoted. So before we go to, to, to questions to, for, to the audience, and again, hashtag ask po, um, if you want to ask a question. The, the question I have is there's probably a lot of people watching online and, and here in the room that are absolutely inspired by the idea of this, but it seems too big, it seems too crazy, it seems too daunting. And the kind of founders that you work with every day, you know, it does take a particular person and um, not necessarily just a skill set, but I think a personality type and a, a tenacity to kind of push through and, and to work in this space. So, you know, what do you think we can do a better job of to getting more people coming into this space, into this industry, into places like IndieBio, into places like Cicada Innovations, you know, into the labs around the world and going, you know, I've got this crazy idea and, and I, I, or I've got this fixation of a problem and, and I want to go on a journey to try and, and solve it. What are, what are some of the things that you think we need to do better to bring more people into this space and come on the journey alongside of us? You know, I think I really appreciate the question because in the question is this understanding that we've got to get biotech out of its silo. You know, that fundamentally people are scared of biotech. It's like I that gene stuff like that. I generally get it, but it's beyond understanding CRISPR. I'm lost. Like I could never do that. There's no chance I, I can't do that. And I, it's hard to believe that. But I could have just done it myself the last three years, you know, Genetics is just another language and, and it's coded for things and there's parts that people don't understand. And, you know, different minds can bring different insights into it, into how it works. It, it's, I know that that seems crazy, like that non-technical people could have an insight, scientific insight, but sometimes it's the intersection of people. It's like, these rooms aren't good with just the scientists in the room either. They need really creative business people to get in there and say, well, what's the business? And then to say, well, that's not a business. Could this be then crazy idea? Could you do this? Because that would be a business. And then they think scientists thinks and goes, I wasn't thinking of doing that, but I think we could do that. And then like, 
It's in that way that you find the best applications of technology. And, you know, who would have known we'd use stem cell technology to make meatballs, right? But that kind of thing happened because those kinds of people in the same room together, they can't get in the same room together if they're in ghettos and silos. Mm -hmm. So like what you're doing at Sakata, it's so important that we bring everybody together, even artists, you know, even children to have different opinions. Arvin and I talk about divergent perception. Mm. I don't want people in the same room who agree with me. I want people who have different points of view and I want to be challenged. And then I also want people who will very rapidly change their mind if they hear a better idea. Mm. But that's what it takes. People are often asked, how does IndieBio kind of do its magic? And I'm like, it ain't magic. We work with many VCs in Australia. We love them. It's great innovation centers. But it's like, it's not magic. It's just putting a pressure on a room and saying, you don't come out of that room until you've got something big and great, yeah. not something sort of good and likable. You know. I, I love that um, that whole idea of divergent perceptions. I think it's such a powerful one, and it you know it, it's such a leveling one because it means you leave ego on the ground, right? It's not about me and me being right. It's actually about can we get to the best outcome and can we actually solve the problem? And that means I have to leave ego at the door and be willing to be completely wrong and give up my idea if it's not the not the best one in the room. So it's it's a it's yeah. a it's it's being passionate about the pursuit of the problem as well. So really good insight. We are gonna throw to some questions from the floor and from Twitter. Sean, have we got anything online that we wanna ask? Yeah, we do actually. We have one come through from Marianne Williams on Twitter and she's asking Poe um, how should the travel industry respond to the biotech opportunity and what do they need to do now and over the next 25 years to reinvent itself? Wow, travel. Not one that was on the list, but it, once we've got the five solved with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we're getting on our planes, we're going somewhere. Yeah, this has been, I have a lot of friends in the travel industry and it's been a real challenge. And I keep sort of saying, okay, but then, you know, literally economies are challenged here because without the purchasing of jet fuel, the entire petroleum chemistry economic stack is being hurt and you're seeing refineries shut down and shortages of, of things like plastics because no one's buying jet fuel. And so it's, this is hitting the travel industry, but it's hitting lots and lots of things. Um, I generally think that, you know, we're going to soon be in a very safe world. And I think that what we've been through will has taught us some lessons and that we will respond with way more dollars going into setting up the system by which we can, like, we broke world records in coming to world with vaccines in just a year, you know. We never bothered to have an influenza vaccine because it takes a year to build one and there's a new one every year. So you're creating the solution, but by the time the solution's there, the problem is gone. Well, we might now go after influenza vaccines because it might be that we could actually have good ones faster. Right now we just predict what is gonna happen with influenza and we go after what we think is going to happen. So I actually think that the world is going to be safe and but I do recognize that feelings of unsafeness will be continuing. And feelings, unfortunately, in that friend versus foe dynamic, feelings of seeing things as foe when they're really your friend. Mm -hmm. And the way that different people around the different world point fingers is more unnerving to me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I remember being on the first flight from San Francisco to Hong Kong after 9-11. And people said they weren't gonna travel and where travel was gonna stop. And I got on that, my wife and I got on that very first flight and like, let's go. And the world recovered. Mm. I think it is a basic human need to bond, to connect, to adventure. And that's satisfied by travel. I know that the industry has been hurt and that's hard, but I know I'm coming back to Sydney. I have family in Melbourne. I know I'm coming back to home. Like that's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And it's probably 
what's going to happen is that we travel more for pleasure and less for work. But it doesn't take a genius to see that, right? I can be talking to you right now for work. I wish I was there, but I'll definitely be coming for my family and I'll definitely be coming for adventure. I love that. We've got any more questions, Sean? Um, yeah, we actually have a question from Marina who's here in the audience. Um, she says, Poe, you say we need to pay for this new technology, but shouldn't that be flipped so we pay to not adopt this new technology? Uh, pay to not adopt the technology. Um, I, I'm missing, Sally help me out here because I'm kind of overhearing it. I think the comment was earlier you were talking about that we need to pay for this new technology, but I think Marina's asking shouldn't we flip that and it's actually we have to pay if we don't adopt this new technology. Ah, I, actually what I was saying is not that we have to pay for it so much as the solutions are there. We like pay for carbon. And um, yes, I agree with you fundamentally that, that sort of essentially people who aren't adopting should pay. That's, a, that's another version of the same financial incentive and it works equally well, except it might be harder politically. That's mm -hmm. all, it's just a political reality that, that essentially emitters don't wanna be charged um, people doing good have to get a subsidy. Uh, but in one way or another, you're reallocating capital in some way to favor a little more the deployment of the new technology. But I 100% agree, that, and thanks for pointing out that there's both sides of that equation. And I think to, to everyone in the audience, we've seen a big impact since January of the European plastics tax. Mm. And you know, plastics are basically about a dollar a kilo, and they, the tax is about a dollar a kilo. So just a dollar a kilo tax has doubled the price of these plastics that are unrecyclable, and it's driven all sort of deals through the supply chain. It's been great. Making people pay for unrecycled plastics has suddenly activated 100 companies that were sitting there waiting for the world to say, someday people will pay for this stuff. And it's a great example, and we need more like that. I think that the big one was this judicial decision against Shell yeah. Oil, which who, who knows? I don't really understand all that and what's really going to happen, and I'm sure it'll be fought and that kind of thing. But at a certain point, I will tell you that everyone we work with, literally in every industry, wants to make these changes, including everyone we work with in, in, in oil and, and gas. Like we have great friends in oil and gas who are trying to drive change through their organizations. So I don't have a sense of uh, like hostility or finger pointing needed. It really comes down to sort of the, the financial incentives of it. Um, I, I love that you mentioned in there the political will because I think it's both the financial incentives and the politics of it. And what's really interesting is what we've observed, I think, in the last sort of year or two in Australia. We've had states, you know, putting in place plastic bag bans. We've had to become mask wearers for health, for the health and well-being of all of those around us, not just ourselves. And all of these things have changed that we thought would be difficult and that we wouldn't adopt. It's amazing how quickly um, that what is seen as a political hurdle, humanity really does adapt very, very quickly. And what was foreign or what was perceived as hard actually becomes a new norm that we don't even think twice about and we truly it does change does become something as, as habitual as what it is to brush your teeth every morning um, so we are kind of full circle in our conversation here in, in reinventing the world at least Maslow's hierarchy of needs and some of the other finer points um, I want to come back to uh, whether you can come to my barbecue or not uh, and whether you're going to get an invite when you're back in Sydney or whether I'm going to have to take you out and have a conversation. Um, how do we come back full circle to our barbecue explainer about the potential for, and I think I'll, I'll give you a, 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 an, easier, a, an easier way about no, why should we be serving? excited? I'm serving, I'm, serve? serving, um, I'm serving the most finest uh, lab grown sirloin steak with a side of plant-based V2 burgers, um, and then you know some freshly grown organic tomatoes from, and, and some, the nonna up the street from me, I do live in Little Italy, she's gonna make some beautiful cheeses for us from her 
buffalo somewhere out on the farm and we'll have some buffalo mozzarella. It'll be fabulous. There'll be great wine. Look, I can guarantee you the great wine. That's, that's the one thing I can guarantee you. But why should we get excited about it? Because I think that's part of the reason to go, I'm willing to lean into a challenging conversation, maybe about some concepts and some science I don't understand. Yeah, so, you know, to your, your parents are at this barbecue, My right? Parents your parents are at this are barbecue, yep. And so I'm going to say, Sally's parents, it's nice to meet you. Sally and I work on a biotech together. And they say, what's biotech? And I say, well, look around here. Biotech is really anything with a genome. So these plants, these beautiful flowers, they have a genome. This, this uh, hot dog that's here, that pig has a genome, that cell-based has a genome. The plants that make up this V2 burger, they came from a genome. It's really those tomatoes that we're putting on top, they have a genome. It's anything with a genome and all of it grows and it grows naturally and beautifully and we're just trying to make sure we do that well. Nicely done. I think that deserves a round of applause. Oh, I just came <laughs> up with that one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save that one. Yep, you, you get to come to the barbecue, so you get the free pass. Um, look, this is, this is a conversation that we could dive into again and again and again, and I do think it is, um, I, I do love that barbecue test and that complexity of it is, because if, if, if I take away anything from today, Poe, is that actually in nature and all around us are the solutions that we need for people, planet and prosperity. And they're the solutions for health. They're the solutions for food. They're solutions for farming, for the future, for the built environment. The solutions exist and we're just on the journey of discovering them and making them usable for everybody so that we can all actually enjoy this planet for you know centuries to come, not days, weeks, months or years. Um, and, and to me, that, that is an exciting opportunity. It's not a challenge, it's, a, it's an opportunity. And they're two sides of the same coin. So I just want to thank you so much for so generously um, giving of your time this morning and spending this, this our morning, your afternoon with us. Um, I love what you're doing. We love the work that you're doing in building these companies and bringing people together and, you know, really providing them a runway and a pathway forward to bring those things to market. We really look forward to welcoming you um, down here when the borders are back open and when you can visit. Um, and you will have to come to Sydney before you go to Melbourne because we want to host you here and have a do-over of the conversation. And we might even put on a barbecue for you um, in That'd the precinct. Um, but thank you so much for your time and your wisdom, wisdom knowledge and expertise. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate spending the morning with you. And um, go out and save the world <laughs> and save us all. So I do want to just take a moment to thank all of you who have come out and braved the chilly morning in, um, in our beautiful venue where we are, you know, the next industrial revolution is happening with some of our companies here. Thank you for those of, that those of you who have joined us online um, to participate this morning. A big thank, to our, thank you to our partners, South Everly, um, who have brought us together here today, and to obviously to the City of Sydney with the Visiting and Entrepreneurs Program. There is more happening with the Visiting Entrepreneurs Program. Don't forget to check out their website, check out our website. We have another event happening next week. Um, I believe it is here um, next Wednesday night with Quantum, so come along with that. It'll be another fun, um, fun event. Uh, you also have an opportunity to come back to the precinct again later this month with the Solstice Festival that's going to be happening. Now, I hear what they're planning is going to be really good. I'm actually going to go to it, so you need to come along as well. Um, and if you want, if you enjoyed this conversation and you want to be a part of what's going on here at Cicada, if you're not already in our newsletter, sign up to our newsletter. Um, you will get a little email reminder from today to do that. But be a part of this. Uh, if we really want to bring solutions to market that do solve for people's health and well-being, that do solve for planet, um, that do solve for future prosperity. We actually need more people involved and engaged in that. So in Kitchen, can, I, I really do strongly urge you to be part of our community. Um, if you're not resident here physically, come along to our events, sign up to our newsletter, connect in with what we're doing with all of our partners across Australia and around the world. Um, and you know, help us make a difference and uh, get involved with all of the things that are happening that are really exciting. 
So thank you very much for today and I hope you go out inspired and um, now have the ability to explain to all your colleagues as you get into your day about what it is that, um, you know, what the opportunity is uh, with, um, you know, Indie Bio, Synthetic Biologies and, and how we can actually change the world. Thanks everyone.